Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am here with Riggs, who is calling it in from beautiful, clear water, Florida, just the opposite end of the United States of where I am at, Portland, Oregon. But today, we're going to be talking about water filtration, which is actually really important. Riggs, I'm not sure if you know this. I've been watching True Detective on HBO, and they've been talking about filtered water and the importance of it. But before we get on that, Riggs, I would love you to introduce yourself. Who is Rig? Well, I'm still on a voyage of self-discovery, but <laughs> I can tell you this, that um, I'm a, I, I came up through tech. Um, in the 80s, I had a uh, tech company in New York City. Um, then in the 90s, of course, the dot-com was paradise for me. I loved it. Had a great time, learned um, disruptive marketing um, and had a career that took me all the way through the software industry. Um, and, um, I was happy camper, but my down, my downfall was ambition, right? That's the entrepreneur's downfall. And, uh, I thought I could be a CEO and some people agreed with me, but then they said, well, but we're doing green. We're not doing no tech. And so we launched a company called at the time origin oil because it was to um, convert algae into a biofuel. So algae was the original oil, right? And uh, what was special about it was, you know, the funding. Now, funding is the crux of all entrepreneurship. Um, and what this particular group did was they immediately took you public in the penny stock space. And by the way, it's not something I recommend today. It's, it's, it doesn't work the same <laughs> way anymore. But back in 2007, it seemed to work okay. And um, we launched this company in the algae industry, and it was a blast. I had a lot of mainstream media. It was super exciting. Unfortunately, the algae space uh, was completely um, made irrelevant by the price of crude, which went from 120 down to like 50 and below. Um, and it still really hasn't recovered. It's crazy, uh, despite inflation and everything else. So... Um, we really realized that that um, closing the company was not an option. So what do we do? We repurpose the technology to clarify water uh, because our tech was to ex to extract algae from the water it lives in, and this was to now we were extracting sewage from the water it lives in. And um, immediately, I found out that the water industry number one, people take it for granted. Uh, open the faucet, water comes out, flush the toilet, water goes away. What's the problem? There's no problem. Uh, let me focus on something important. And secondly, the media really could have cared less. They're like, really? Water? And they're trying to stifle a yawn, you know? Like, So, whereas, you know, I remember meeting with a um, Fast Company editor in Manhattan. And normally, Fast Company, so tell me about this cool new thing you got. I say water, they go, oh my God, no, please don't talk to me about water. And so what we found was, and the third thing is, is that the water industry itself is very change phobic. They, they like the way things are right now. Now, unfortunately, that where it's at is not great. The water industry is not in a great place at all. Um, <clears throat> all kinds of interesting things, for example, way underfunded by literally $100 billion a year by now. Um, in the US alone, it's, it's a number that is almost incomprehensible. And even if you were going to build big central sewage systems, where are you going to, where we're going to build it, right? Um, things are built out. And additionally, since COVID, there's been a lot of migration and the little tiny rural water systems that are just completely overwhelmed by all the um, housing development and uh, manufacturing and moves, moving out and so forth. So it's an interesting place. Um, but fortunately, I did find a way forward. So yes, we're gonna we're gonna briefly talk about the way forward. But first, I you know, Riggs, what you really kind of identified, you know, is the water crisis and not not being kind of spoken about. One of the things you also mentioned was it affecting those rural communities, uh, you know. And so, folks, I really want you guys to listen to this. I'm an Oregonian. I'm I'm based here in Oregonian. We're ninety eight thousand square miles. However, groundwater population in Umatilla and Morrow counties is growing worse leading to dangerous levels of nitration in water pumped up from used safe water cells or water uh, safe water wells. So it's like, to your point, right? And, and these are our rural community members. Uh, this is not a big, you know, I think 
sadly, sometimes maybe why it's not spoken about is because it is kind of in a lower population density area where it's affecting a lot of communities and it's not hitting that metro area. And so folks listening, because I know there's a lot of Oregonians listening, you know, I really want you to begin to think about this. And I, so I hope this uh, the lecture in particular, this conversation is very important because this is actually affecting he, us here in the state of Oregon. So Riggs, tell us, what is your current venture business? What, what, what are you currently doing? So what, what we were trying to figure out at the time was how to take this technology, which had been born in algae, and we were transferring it over to water, how to license it out. And that was going nowhere. And uh, finally, I realized that um, technology takes a decade or more to be uh, accepted in water. So um, we, we turned to a commercial model. And specifically, I learned from some early research in 2016 that decentralization is a thing in water. Um, industry and agriculture is responsible for 90% of all water demand in the United States, in the world, actually. It's 90% all around. The ratio between business and agriculture, of course, varies according to, you know, Somalia, it's almost all agriculture. Here, it's about half and half. So um, the, the, big, the big users are not the people. The big users are the industry and agriculture. And in California, I was in California until until the 2020, and we were talking take shorter showers and so forth. Well, if you're only 10 percent of the demand, uh, that's not going to move the needle. What's going to move the needle is what you do with industry and agriculture. And so, what I was predicting then would happen has since happened, which is a movement towards people businesses treating their own dirty water. Why? It's cheaper. They can recycle their water, saving even more money. And thirdly, for a lot of you entrepreneurs, is you're not stuck with the politics of the local water utility. You're on your own. It's great. So a lot of businesses like it, and so it's become a thing. And so we hitched our wagon to decentralization. We bought a company that was operating in the space that does exactly that. We created another company that does these little drop-in-the-place pods for smaller sites, and finally, we devised a way to avoid the capital expense. So if you're going to do your own water treatment, you don't have a spare million dollars, don't worry about it. Just sign here and we'll give it to you as a service. And that's the latest thing. So we are firmly in the water as a service space for this new decentralized thing. And, and you know, one of the things you kind of mentioned too was like inflation. How does inflation affect the water and, and things that are going on? Like, where is inflation going and what are the threats? Water and sewage rates have been inflating now faster than college tuition. Oh, wow. Interesting. And much faster than health, health expenses. And the reason is, I told you that there's this big deficit annually. So utilities are trying to make it up, but they can't raise rates enough. And unfortunately, it's also creating a lot of um, defaults by ordinary people. And now you're poor, you can't pay your water bill. Now you're stuck with bottled water. It's even worse. It's, it's, a, it's a terrible situation, and yet it's a growing problem. So um, there's big inflation in water, and, uh, which is why businesses would want to do their own system, because you have the cost of the system and you're done. You know, you, you're not, you, whatever the costs are of maintaining it, it there's inflation, but it's not the crazy inflation. So that's a big, big deal. You know, that's good to know because uh, I think I can finally go and tell my wife, hey, Riggs told me that water prices are going, I'm not crazy. I swear I'm not taking longer showers. It is the inflation of the water <laughs> that is making it go up. Now, Riggs, I'm a, I'm a, I like to invest on the side. I like, I like wealth management. I like to kind of build up my own generational wealth. Now, with that, I'm beginning to think about, okay, utilities. I can go purchase gold. I can purchase silver. Is water going to be the new gold? And why is it that investor like myself, why can't I invest directly in a water project? But you know, you're, you're feeding me questions that, that are perfect for me because there's been a problem with investing in water because it's been a monopoly, right? Water utilities, it's, they, they're the source of the water. And by the way, we're not talking about changing that. The water should still come from the utilities because <clears throat> every attempt to privatize fresh water has been a disaster but I'm talking about uh, treating the dirty water. And that has been a, a monopoly. And so you could either invest in American Water Works, Veolia, 
Suez. Uh, well, Suez got a uh, purchase, but Evoqua, et cetera. Okay. But they just grow the way S&Ps grow. Fine. You can um, invest in an ETF. Fine. But if you want to make an asset investment, that's been lacking. Um, when I told you that we're creating water as a service and people don't have to pay for their machine, well, then who does? And so we created an investment vehicle, very similar to oil and well, um, called Master Limited Partnerships in the oil and well space, or the oil, the um, gas and oil space. And it pays dividends just like that. And there's equity rewards, ownership of the parent company, ownership of this new company called Water on Demand. Um, and so, and what's great is you, you can place a lien on the equipment to enforce your royalties because... We, we, the ownership is not handed over to the end user. We continue to own it and they pay by the gallon. It's a profitable model because like all services, I mean, I remember when, when you, you could pay $120 for Microsoft office and that was it. Now you pay, you know, $14.99 a month. So adds up to a lot more over time. And yet we like it because they're much more responsive. There's more, they throw more things in for free. I'm, I, I don't mind paying monthly with uh, Microsoft 365 because of all the value they add. So it's more profitable and the end user likes it more. So water on demand now is an investment vehicle. And by the way, we're not the only people doing water as a service, but we're the only people who are making it open to everyday investors. You know, that's, that's very interesting. You know, the whole water on demand concept and also the subscription model, I think, you're seeing the subscription model really take hold in the entrepreneurship world because, you know, as, as Riggs mentioned, it, it, it provides two different things that uh, that's really cool. One, it creates value for the organization by having a value stream that's a subscription model that's on a monthly payment. And then two, it creates value back to the consumer because that consumer now feels that concierge service, right? This tailored service that's directly catered to them. Uh, and, you know, when you feel like a subscription model, like, I'm not talking about like a Netflix subscription when everybody gets the same thing. I'm talking like a, you know, a true subscription model. Like for example, this morning I got an email from the golf now folks. I'm like, Hey, by the way, you got $10 off this month on going golfing. Sweet. That is a valuable subscription to me, right? That I'm paying on an annual basis. And now, now granted, they also have these tournaments that come up and they, all these things, but I'm willing to pay that fee because sure. I find a value in it. Right. And so for the listeners at home, think about that when you're kind of creating a subscription model. If you do decide to go that route, it's imperative that it's also valuable to the end user, not not just to you, the the, the um, you know, organization. Certainly, yes, you want you want to create a value for yourself. Right. You need to help the bottom line, but you, you want to make sure uh, to feed the people that are feeding you right now. Let's take a step back because I want to I want to kind of take a step. How the heck like you mentioned, you went from you know, doing the allergy to the water, but what, what were you doing before all that? Like, how did you, how did you think allergy? Well, algae was basically told to me, right? Um, <laughs> because as I was, I was uh, in the intro, I was talking about my, my software career and I was having a fine time. Uh, the last company I did in the software space um, went on the NASDAQ um, right. and it, it was, a, it was a success. So it was a, um, they, it was a malware company, and which is a hot space to this day. Um, and I was the number two as the president COO of that. So what happened was I was a true entrepreneur until 1995. I did a billion things. I, I did. Uh, I was in the nonprofit space. I was a ship captain for a while on oh, wow. ships in the South Pacific. Uh, I was, um, you know, a um, direct marketer. Uh, and then I had this, I built a company in New York City that computerized companies for the first time um, because back then it was all safeguard ledgers. And then it got, it changed radically in the 80s. And I was part of that, the transformation. And then um, end of 80s, early 90s, um, I did the, you know, living in LA, I did the obligatory um, working in film thing. Everybody, oh, yeah. in LA. <laughs> Everybody in LA does that. So I went through that, loved it. But um, ultimately I was drawn back to tech. And uh, in the um, mid nineties, my tech um, career, I went corporate. 
1995, I went corporate and I started launching brands in, you know, public companies and having a great time doing it. And so that was kind of my thing. I had several liquidity events, you know, where you get, where you get to, um, it's, it's always interesting when you sell a company to see how much it gets destroyed as part of the sale. But nonetheless, we made out okay. And it was really this is my, my ambition to become a, a CEO. And I was given, the, well, okay, you want to be a CEO, do algae. Okay. Um, and I happened to have a brother who had, who had a um, patent that could be applied to, to the algae space. And so we had a technology. Um, I've always been, I believe that technology is the big transformation. Um, you know, for example, look at climate change, right? All of the solutions that we're being fed are solutions that themselves are fossil fuel hungry, right? Except for nuclear power. And I used to bring up nuclear power all the time. That, well, it takes 20 years to build a nuclear plant, blah, blah, blah. Now, literally, I saw a Chinese company that created a, a nuclear-powered smartphone <laughs> Oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't buy that. Okay, I just. I, I, <laughs> Sounds a little. I wouldn't carry yeah. around a nuclear <laughs> reactor in my back pocket. Uh, I'm just saying. But the point that it makes is that you can go small, right? You could have um, a housing development or an office building being powered for 500 years by one pellet of uranium, right? So that that's that's kind of um, what I'm saying is that if we implemented that, the whole climate change picture would change. We wouldn't have to worry about, you know, um, whether we have to eat insects or not. We would just have nuclear power replacing fossil fuel, end of story. So um, I feel the same way about technology in high tech that is highly transformative. When you think about, you know, I have a computer right here, right? Yeah. yeah. That computer is <laughs> so much more powerful than the mainframes we used to deal with in the in the late 60s. So um, I'm a strong believer in, in the power of technology to transform everything fine. At the same time, um, it everything's being made. Like there's no such thing as a high-tech company anymore. All companies have a technology aspect today. There's just no getting around it. So what's my technology angle in water? And that's why we move very quickly uh, to decentralization, uh, which now it breaks the monopoly. And just like how AT&T turned into a huge industry, yep, yep, AT&T got broken point. up and it became everything, including the internet. Well, no, no more princess phones, but a huge, huge, huge industry. Same thing is happening in water. As it breaks up, it creates all these entrepreneurial opportunities. For example, water on demand is a pure fintech. We're there to raise money to put into these systems. But then um, in Seattle or Oregon, we're not going to go install and maintain these systems. We're going to delegate it. Well, that turns that that creates an entrepreneurial opportunity for all those water companies. Because they're like, now they get from water on demand comes along and says, here, I got a check, go build it. Uh, it's so wonderful for them. So People love it. They're excited about it. And we've started to get into very interesting new verticals. Um, for example, mobile home parks, trailer parks are a huge vertical that every single one of them needs better sanitation. 90% of them have bad sanitation. Um, it's just because how they were built. So now there's groups that are going in there and just going, bub, 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 serially going in there and going, do, 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 do. And they want the pods. They want the they want the water as a service. They don't want to. They want the. They don't want the capital requirements. This is ideally made for it. And so we're we're literally about to. We are. We've been revving up. Um, we doubled our business twenty one to twenty two. Um, our our water pod business grew uh, seven times between uh, uh, twenty twenty one and twenty twenty three. So um, it's it's going fast. So. You know, we're, we're very excited about that. Um, and Water On Demand is now slated to go to the NASDAQ as part as being purchased by one of those blank check companies. Yeah, yeah. And so we've birthed the company, achieved a $32 million valuation for it. 
as a private company and we have it in a definitive merger agreement and that's going through the SEC process right now, which is makes it even better for the purpose of being an investment vehicle for people. Yeah, definitely. You know, to, so I'm going to take a step back for the, for the folks listening is that there's two cool things that Riggs mentioned that I just want to define for you. One was diversification and one was vertical integration. So diversification, as, as Riggs mentioned, at t right, how they kind of diversified their offerings. They went from cable internet to cell phones to internet to internet or satellite TV. That's just uh, diversification, right? Spreading out your kind of brand at different market segments. Now, Riggs also talked about vertical integration. So as Riggs was mentioning, you know, currently he's in the water industry focusing on, you know, businesses, but now they're vertically integrated into the RV sector. So what that means is they're still do it, talking about water. They're just doing now a different market segment in that water area. I, I really love to uh, pull those things out for the listeners because it's just really good to kind of hear it in practical sense. Now, now Riggs, I got to say, building a water brand, like, whoa. This is all new, right? So what like what does it take to disrupt a slow moving industry like the water brand? Well, you you find the point like change is inevitable. In 2016, I came across a research paper by Lux Research that said decentralization is a thing. I started to proselytize it. And people were like, "What? What are you talking about?" I was way too early, but you kind of have to be early, right? You have to put your marker on things so you're the decentralization guy. So by the time um, we started, we, we, we built a company from scratch in 2018, the one that does the pods specifically for this, and they didn't become profitable in 20, until 2021, and now they're booming. So things kind of hockey sticked starting in 2021, 2022, where a whole lot of businesses, trailer parks, housing developments, uh, power plants, you name it. Everybody's, everybody wants to do their own water treatment. And then you have the problem of huge land booms. There's a big land boom going on north of Dallas, Texas, between Dallas and the Oklahoma border. It's going crazy. They're building housing developments like crazy, way ahead of sewage. And so they need those pods, boom. And that's what we've been doing. We've been dropping those pods in. And it's a, it's a financial solution for the developer and also a time solution. It takes time to build five, 10, 15 miles of sewage plant, of sewage line, right? So um, getting, the fr getting the fresh water is a challenge, but it's not as big a challenge as this, you know, cleaning the dirty water. Because for example, one of our sites is on the shores of Lake Denison, uh, which is on the Oklahoma border. Who wants to pollute Lake Denison? Right. Yeah, yeah, very much. Yeah, <laughs> who wants to pollute any lake, right? I exactly. mean, I don't, think, I don't think that's the goal. Now, let's talk about the process that you're now going through. Uh, so, Origin Clear, you mentioned you had a very high valuation of over $35 million, and now you're going public. You're taking it on the stock exchange. Give the give the audience a little bit. What does that one? What does it mean to go from a private company to a public company, and then how do you do it? Okay, Origin Clear has been public for 16 years. Okay, perfect. That's the parent company. We we because the people we were working with had this this um, they they raised money in the public space. So it's been a penny stock forever. Uh, you can OCLN is the ticker. It's literally a penny. But what we did was we had we in November twenty twenty two we were presented with an opportunity to merge with what's called a blank check company, a special purpose acquisition company. And these things are just a pile of money looking for something to buy. That's all they are. But here's the thing. It was already on the NASDAQ. So we couldn't do it. Origin Clear, it, it, it was um, cleaning up the, um, I don't want to get too technical, but cleaning up the cap table was a big deal. We had a lot of preferred shares, et cetera. So we then said, no, no, no. We're not going to have our company be bought. We're going to have our creation, Water on Demand, which we'd already created. That's who we're going to put up to be bought. And so that is what we achieved the $32 million valuation for, independent of the valuation of Origin Clear, which is something like, I don't know, 10, 15 million. Um, water on Demand does not trade. Yeah. But assuming that the SEC approves our merger and the NASDAQ approves our application, we will be trading on the NASDAQ. Water on demand will, and we already have the ticker. It's W-O-D-I. So we've been reserved a ticker by NASDAQ. 
and um, that will that's a true that's a true pre IPO. And so right now people are investing not in water on demand because it's going into quiet period, but they're investing in Origin Clear, which happens to own a huge stake in water on demand, and that's how it's happening. And they're getting these uh, water as a service royalties as well. Man, I'm gonna go log on and go buy some Origin <laughs> Clear real quick. Man, this is see, I really love this stories because I think what it really tells you for the for the listeners it. There's a lot of things that go in the background. You know, Riggs has been mentioned that he's doing it for 30, 40 years, you know, really working through different industries, working in different industries, getting experiences from different markets. And it's all culminating into this one big idea and really kind of pushing things forward. And the beauty I, I really like about it, at the end of the day, yeah, sure, we're, we're you know, bi business centric, right? We're trying to create a revenue, but it's also helping communities right? Providing clear water. And then as, as Riggs mentioned, you know, outsourcing a lot of these jobs. Okay. Now you have, now you actually have some individuals uh, creating more jobs in their local economy, right? And and that's, that's the goal. How do we actually get individuals back into the work? How do we get in the local economy? How do we get them to think entrepreneurially? Because at the end of the day, this country was built on the back of entrepreneurs, right? And so, so the really goal is just to try to make sure that we exploit that and those educational opportunities for our listeners. Now, Riggs, what would you say, you know, looking back on, on your experience, what would you say is something that you're glad you went through because it's helped you be successful today? Well, I'm I'm glad that I wasted my time doing things that were not the career path, right? Like working for a time in film, uh, like going to the sea in ships and literally um, tramp steaming around South Pacific islands with loads of coconut. I mean, that, well, first of all, it, it teaches you how to handle um, tight situations, emergencies. Oh, the ship's going to sink. Well, today my ship's not sinking, but like all entrepreneurs, I have to look at well, what is the viability of the company? I was listening to the all in the all in the all in um, the all in summit um, about a year ago, um, and Elon Musk, you know, doing okay, right? And so they said, so um, I, I, you do you feel secure about your, about your cash position? He goes, no, it's just that my cash horizon's further out. That's all. He still has a concern about running out of cash, and yet he's got billions. So what it tells you is you will always have that, and you have to learn to rise above it. Um, you know, I, I, I have people who get very like, oh, I don't know how we're going to make it. And I, one of my jobs in the company is to go, okay, here's how we're going to handle it. We're going to do this, this, this. And they go, oh, okay, fine, right? Um, because... Intention is everything, right? Imagination creates reality, is a very good saying. So here we are, we imagine something, and we make it real. There's no situation that you can't work your way out of. None. It doesn't exist. That's just how it is. That's what I've learned. Because in the 80s, that business that I built in the 80s, computerizing companies, I shut it down voluntarily because I didn't think the money was in it. And the guy I gave the business to, he made it, he became a millionaire. How? Because he found that the ongoing um, annuity from being an IT shop for companies is a multi-decade life cycle, right? And I was, you don't make money when you first computerize a company. It's terrible. It's horrible. But then you have the gravy of the monthly fees, right? And I didn't factor that in. I could have made it just fine. And it was just, I literally, I became discouraged. So when you become discouraged, you got to find out where, where the exit is. What, what, what's the better idea, right? It always is there. The better idea is always there. And Rick, you are talking to my soul. I've been having a very strange last couple of months where, to be honest with you folks, I've been kind of thinking about this podcast, you know, do, do we continue with it? Do we pivot to something else? Uh, got a lot of time focused on the nonprofit Latino founders that we started about a year ago, raised over, you know, quarter million dollars in a year. And uh, we've been able to help over, you know, 15 or 20 different entrepreneurs last year, gave out about $30,000 with a grant funding. But the podcast, I love it, right? It's a business. And, and, and like any other business, you, you're always constantly thinking, as, as Riggs mentioned, 
Um, where, where, what do I do next? Do I pivot? How do I vertically integrate it? Or how do I diversify it? Right. And so obviously we have the diversification, a quick shameless plug. We have the newsletter, right? Which you can subscribe to by visiting the shades of e.com. Right. So that's diversification. We have again, another shameless plug. We have clothing. So you can go buy a sweater or a shirt, which also again, helps support the shades of entrepreneurship. But, you know, to Rig's point, I'm kind of at this at this kind of crossroads, like what's the next idea, right? And and I had a meeting last night with two individuals and talking about future iterations of what what life could be like. I've been in the healthcare industry for almost you know twenty five years now. Uh, mm -hmm. Got a lot of wealth management education under my belt. Do we do we begin to create a specific wealth management firm for providers in the Pacific Northwest? Well, health is booming. That's for sure. That's health is it, booming. Sometimes my health is booming in the worst way though, right? <laughs> so it's going the opposite way. Now, Riggs, if folks are interested in kind of hearing more about Clear Origin, they want to contact you, maybe the internet uh, got their website. How can they get in contact with you? What are your social channels? Okay. First of all, Origin Clear uh, has a, uh, we do a weekly CEO briefing on Thursday nights, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, tonight's is going to be the 246th. Um, briefing that I do. It's essentially a podcast, but it's very specifically focused on the economic environment that we're operating in with the world of assets, because now we're competing with other assets. Number two, how, how, how's the water industry? What's going on with that? Uh, for example, last week I reported on the state of our rivers, which is terrible. Um, and then we discussed the company itself and you can learn a lot about what we do, the projects we're doing and so forth. So that's number one. Number two, Top right of, or, of the originclear.com website is a green invest now button and listen to Ken Berenger, the creator of uh, Water on Demand, tell you all about this new investable asset, which what's good about it is it's early. The problem we have with oil, with gold, with all assets uh, is that they're being manipulated. I, ha I have gold. Why? It should be going up. Why, is it, why it's not, I have no idea. But water is not being manipulated yet because it's just coming out into the market and it's a steady up trend of demand, right? Water demand does not go up and down. It just keeps going up. So the, the, the point I'm making is it's a great asset investment. Um, we very, right now it's for accredited investors. Within, I would say a month, I'm hoping to have a crowdfunding offering for any investor with a very low minimum. Join, join the fun, um, you know, and potential upside. So uh, obviously, like all equity investments, you know, nothing's guaranteed. But, you know, we are very, very, very excited about what we're doing in the water industry. And we, we paid the dues for being early. Um, but it also means that we're there and we're in the right position. And we invite your listeners to go take a look. Yes, I would I would gladly invite the listeners to also take a look. In fact, this information will also be on the newsletter to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, the newsletter that comes out every Wednesday. Uh, so I would highly recommend. Now, I am not, folks, I'm not a financial advisor, uh, but I, I always love looking at investment in stocks and kind of, you know, doing some things. Um, and, you know, I think one newsletter that I might write coming up is kind of talk about the difference between like a 401k and an IRA and making sure everybody knows the difference and maximizing those benefits as well, because investing is so important when you're thinking about creating generational wealth, right? And that's yeah. that's truly the emphasis of this uh, podcast is to really help the individuals that are listening, one, to succeed in their entrepreneurial endeavor, and two, to really help establish generational wealth for yourself and your family, right? We, we truly want to keep building. Now, now, Riggs, is there any last words you'd like to say before we, we leave today? Well, I've been thinking a lot about the concept called break to build. Now, this came from an um, uh, Air Jordan commercial from a long time ago, 10, 15 years ago. But they used it once, break to build. And I, I like that. And so you've got to be willing to break your model to build, right? There's a wonderful book called The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen, where he talks about companies that were unable to break. They, they had a, like this drive industry. I'm selling plenty of 28-inch disk drives. What's my problem? Your problem, dude, is that you, there's 14-inch disk drives coming along. It's going to destroy your business. And company after company after company was destroyed 
by this constant cascade of new uh, stuff. And so you've got to be willing to break your model to build a new. And I started a Substack that um, it's called Break to Build. And uh, I, I'm fascinated by that. And I think, but you got to break to build with a team. That's the second thing I really want to emphasize. I analyzed, um, I had a big epiphany uh, late last year where I realized that I'd been a, I'd been a, a hero on my life. But you go, whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, no. It doesn't scale. Being a, being a Superman doesn't scale. You can't be Superman everywhere. It's impossible. You can be League of Avengers, right? Be a team. And so that's where I realized it's like everything is a team. Without a team, you will not scale your business. So that's the number one thing to, to if you're going to break to build, fine, but do it with a team. Man, I love it. I love it. You know, it's 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 interesting you say that because I I think that's where I'm kind of working on right now is is how do I build with a team? How do I how do I create my team? Who's the right person for the team? You know, so some of the things we're thinking about is like sure. who's who's the finance guy? Who's the marketing guy? Who's the business guy? Right? Who's who's there's there's different pieces and all of them are extremely valuable uh, to build a team. Uh, Riggs, thank you so much for your time. This has been uh, very informative. I, I truly, I, I think one, you know, again, being able to explain the difference between diversification and vertical integration, talking about the importance of water filtration and why it's needed, uh, talking about possible, uh, you, know, you know, investing opportunities that are going to be arising here in the future, which is super, super cool. And again, you know, encouraging folks to continue to grow, uh, break it, you know, build it to break it, I think is, is a phenomenal uh, concept. Uh, in fact, a great, great story for that one is, is a blockbuster video, right? Where uh, they they couldn't innovate. They didn't pivot. In fact, they even had an opportunity to purchase Netflix. I know, mine. what a story. That man, I mean, that is just amazing, right? Uh, Reed Hastings went to them. Yeah, yeah. And no, they Netflix, laughed him out of the room. Netflix went to Blockbuster and said, hey, we have this phenomenal product. And Blockbuster is like, no, we got it good. Because again, like Riggs mentioned, it's sometimes it's, we're already good in this space. There's nothing going to just, we haven't changed since, you know, 1972 when the VHSs came out, right? Well, guess what? Those change. And now look at the DVD on demand. It's gone, right? It's now all streaming, right? And so, so it's, true. It's, 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 and you, it's kind of funny how quickly things innovate. I remember when mini discs came out as well, went from like tape recorders to CDs to these mini discs that only lasted like two years because as soon as the mini discs, all of a sudden streaming services came out. So it's like everything has an end goal. And so I really love that concept, you know, build it to break it because break to build you, or break to build because you, you truly have to, I'm not saying you have to always be looking forward and looking like the, the, the world's falling and everything's going to crash down. No, but constantly thinking of innovation, right? Thinking of ways, different ways to innovate. How do you continue to create value for your, for your organization and also for the consumer at large? So with that, Riggs, thank you again so much uh, for your time. It has been a phenomenal conversation. For those listening, please enjoy the night. You can follow us on the Shades of Entrepreneurship at the Shades of E on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. So you can subscribe on YouTube. And again, for those that are interested, for $5 a month, you can join our Patreon page, which actually gives you access to the recording a week earlier. You also have access to our book and other valuable stuff. Uh, Riggs, thank you again so much for your time. I appreciate it. Appreciate it and have a great night.